Okay, welcome back. It is January 1870 then, and uh, the beginning of another decade, 20 years in to a 70-year uh, campaign, so 50 years to go. And I mean, this uh, this campaign began on, I think it was the 1st of January this year, so it's probably going to be a you know good couple of years. Uh, it's been a really good start to the campaign, I think, that goes without saying. I mean, it, it couldn't have been better, really. We've had a couple of touch-and-go moments, but uh, military conflicts have, have generally been resolved sort of favorably. And um, we enter the 1870s as we enter the 1860s out of war with Austria. And certainly Austria does now feel much more manageable than it did 10 years ago. It really feels like there was a bit of a lag effect in terms of our kind of hobbling of Austria, the destruction of the productive forces of the Austrian Empire and the benefits that we're reaping from that. Um, now, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean to say that the Austrian economy doesn't exist or anything like this. It just means that the really large enterprises agricultural enterprises and factories are destroyed of course austria still has an economy weighted heavily towards small-scale production the guilds the petty bourgeoisie it still produces a lot of agricultural produce and manufactured goods it's just that you know i mean it, it's not an economy of scale it, it's the really really large manufactories uh, that count in this period and it's that it's the transactions from those goods that those sort of um the tax on the transaction of those goods that really kind of build up your gold reserves and austria doesn't have that and so that you know i think it's it's they just feel much more manageable as a result and the war feels like a done deal i'm sort of tempting fate by saying that but i mean our offensive from sort of transylvania has been successful we're beginning to make and we're really in sort of staging areas now to secure the east bank of the danube and our position around um, Vienna now feels very concrete. Um, we've, we've got a really secure position on the west bank of the Danube. We have had to kind of leave the left flank vulnerable for the time being, but I think that Austria's window um, to sort of salvage the situation again has, they've let it sort of slip by. And I think now we're going to be looking at an Austrian army that, that is just going to be gradually atrophying in strength and just sort of withering away. We have now, at this point, departed heavily from the historical script. I mean, if we consider that the, eight, the sort of the 19th century, the 1800s, the period that this game depicts, for the most part, of course, you know, with the exception, the obvious exception being the end of the game, which is the First World War, is um, it's a period characterized as kind of Pax Britannica. It's a period of relative kind of peace. It doesn't mean to say that there aren't wars, um, but for the most part in Europe, uh, the wars are proximity conflicts, they're very limited, they're relatively brief. They are really the wars principally of German and Italian unification involving the 66 war between Austria and Prussia, and then the 1870 war uh, between Prussia and France, and uh, was I think it's a 59 uh, between France and Austria, maybe 58, um, for Italian unification. They're relatively brief, small conflicts. The uh, Crimean War lingers a little bit long, but the Crimean, Crimean War has much more of the, the, the character almost of a colonial conflict. Russia is very undeveloped. It really struggles to project its strength into the Crimea, and the Crimea is almost still a little bit like a colony to Russia at this time. It's sparsely populated. It's mostly Tartars that live in Crimea in the 1850s, sort of and it's actually easier for the British and the French to send steamers and land troops onto the Crimean Peninsula than it is for Russia to get troops into Crimea. There are no railroads in Crimea in the early, in the early 1850s. And um, it, is, it, has, it is a war that certainly has fairly bloody moments. But, I mean, the really, really kind of bloody, ghastly conflicts during this period are, I suppose, the American Civil War, the Taiping Rebellion. They're very bloody affairs. The, the result in the deaths of hundreds of thousands or millions of men. But North America and China, in sharp contrast to today, during this period, are peripheral, kind of, they're peripheral places. I mean, the, uh, today, they're the most important places in the world, and Europe is, frankly, a bit of a backwater in the early 21st century, but the roles are sort of reversed, I suppose, in the kind of mid-19th century. Um, so to that end, I suppose they don't really count, you know, um, in terms of how Europeans view the period, and it's viewed as a kind of... A period of kind of peace and then it's sort of uh, towards the end from the 1890s you had the kind of belle epoque you know um leading into the first world war but i would probably say that our war with austria um i mean it is a proximity conflict insofar as it doesn't really involve other nations but it is a long bloody and ghastly conflict you know it's it, i would i would probably suggest that as many people at least would have died in this conflict than would have died in the american civil war and 
a lot of that is just because the war has been going on uh, for a long period of time. Um, again, it's punctuated by periods of peace, but especially the Second War, which was very, very closely fought. It was mostly fought in Bulgaria. That was a very, very bloody war. Um, and the wars since then have frankly been not cakewalks, but, it, you know, Austria's felt very, very manageable. Because we've departed so much from the historical script, from 1870 onwards, from now onwards, the options are going to be changed. And we can do this without feeling too grubby. We're not really going to benefit much from this, because in terms of the areas that we're going to colonize, we're going to keep on focusing on, um, uh, on, on East Africa, um, sort of the Horn of Africa, um, and the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but we're going to extend spheres of influence to allow for more colonial conflict between powers. Um, because even though the only large war in Europe has involved us, there will be a butterfly effect. It might serve to make other powers a bit more kind of belligerent, and maybe some powers less belligerent. But I think we're just living in too much of a parallel universe in our 1870 uh, to really restrict gain to spheres of influence. So we're going to keep extended claims and extended spheres of influence open. Uh, from this point onwards, um, I think it would have been it was a reasonable thing to do, you know, um, in the first 20 years uh, of the game. It was reasonable to restrict it to sort of fairly historical. This is not going to impact us very much for one very simple reason: from 1877 seven onwards, from the end of this decade, 77, 78, I think it is, we will end up with Abdul Hamid, uh, who is a, not a very capable monarch. He's going to be in power for about 30 years. He's a complete out-and-out -out isolationist. We pretty much have no diplomatic income uh, during that period, which really reflects uh, Ottoman kind of withdrawal, really, uh, from the world during his reign. And um, even though he's going to be inheriting a very different kind of Ottoman Empire, we have to accept the fact that having an absolutist kind of system means that, you know, uh, it's going to be hit and miss who <laughs> ends up on the throne. And some, you know, we don't, we're not really playing a monarch, we're playing the administration, the civil service, and we're going to try and govern effectively despite our monarch, but he is our monarch nonetheless, and at the end of this decade he'll come to power. That will limit what we can do. It means that we will not be able to declare war on anyone. It means that we won't be able to convert any territories into protectorates or, or colonies. We're going to be a, a completely defensive power during this period, and this is going to be... This, this is what he's looking to do, is to preserve the position of the Ottoman Empire. Now, because we're the Ottomans during this period, the wars will come to us, and we can still acquire territories. If we convincingly defeat powers in wars, defensive wars, they will um, offer us territorial concessions in order to end the conflict. So we can still gain out of it. It just means that we won't be able to you know, prosecute uh, aggressive conflict against other powers, um, you know, these conflicts are never going to be fought on our terms and we won't be able to kind of dictate uh, the end result of, it, of that conflict. Unlike the conflict that we're in now with Austria, which is our first and only offensive conflict of the campaign so far, and we intend to dictate terms. We're going to be looking, I think, at Bucharest and maybe Kataru or Dalmatia. But we're going to be looking at two provinces, ideally. We don't have the war score yet to do it. And my thinking is, I mean... Operations from now until March are going to be mostly focused around not really mopping up, but consolidating our position. So Army Group East is going to look to secure the east bank of the Danube and Hungary, secure kind of East Budapest, uh, with two of the armies, uh, the 6th and 4th armies, are going to look to prosecute an offensive into the Carpathians, secure the borders so, uh, of uh, Lemberg and Bukovina, and then ultimately Krakow, and we'll probably look to try and push north to take Prague as well. Um, it's securing these really important kind of victory locations, these places of political and cultural significance that will provide us with the basis for um, favorable conditions at the peace conference table. Um, so without further ado, um, Army Group East, um, having well, really having secured kind of staging areas at Sombor and uh, Grossvarden, uh, we're now going to be moving into Eastern Hungary. So we're going to move uh, Avdi Pasha, in command of the 7th Army, uh, we're going to look to con conduct an assault on East uh, Budapest. There are mixed forces in East Budapest. It looks like they're, for the most part, garrison forces. Well, I can see they're garrison forces, for the most part. A lot of their forces look to be under strength now. So, I mean, their forces are going to just wither. Wi I think they're already kind of withering away. And this is just an effect of their national morale completely tanking. Uh, yeah, it's at zero. 
and their raw combat power is is now uh, about sort of three quarters of ours. Uh, it's significantly sort of uh, weaker. In real terms, it's weaker. Um, we're going to move the sixth army now. The sixth army under Akhen Mutar is not activated, so we're going to have to keep him in a defensive posture. Um, but I think he's so. I mean, he has such a crushing superiority over over the Austria over the Austrian forces in Bukovina that it's it's. I can't see him sort of uh, having any kind of problems at all securing uh, that city. We're going to um, set Bezid Pasha to an assault posture, and we're going to look to conduct an assault on uh, Klaus. Is it Klaus? Yeah, Klausenberg, I think. Um, the weather is really bad. I mean, it's it's like heavy snowfall now um, through most of the Balkans, uh, or at least the central and northern Balkans. So, uh, you know, our sort of... Yeah, in our area of operations, it's very, very difficult weather, which means that forces are going to sort of suffer heavy kind of um, organizational losses as they move and, and this kind of thing. Um, and in some cases, there might be some defensive advantages, but... I think our position now is so overwhelmingly strong, I can't foresee there being any problems. In the most recent engagement at Grossvard, and we did capture enough Austrian officers and POWs to form uh, the basis for an Austrian volunteer force. It might be comprised of Hungarians or Romanians or something. We're going to get them down to Plevna uh, by rail. Uh, we'll set to evade combat. Uh, we don't want to force march. We want to enter Plevna when now. It'll take them 14 days. And we can begin to construct a formation uh, in Plevna. So we've got the 7th Army moving into East Budapest and we're going to move Abdelkarim Nadir's 3rd Army to secure uh, Debrecen. That's Army Group East. Army Group um, West is going to just maintain its position. Um, the 2nd Army is activated. So we're going to set to an, an offensive posture. Uh, but we're going to maintain his position there. This is, we're really just doing this in case any Austrian forces attempt to cross south, uh, across the Drava south. We just want to engage them on our own terms. We want to engage them in an offensive action. We have subtracted one of the army corps and placed it inside. He hasn't, you know, he still hasn't received. You can see from these chevrons that one of the elements is still absent. So we've just put this force inside um, uh, Pizza Varden for the time being um, because. This army corps was so badly beaten up, it had lost some elements, that uh, I think probably using the shelter will benefit that army corps uh, in terms of getting it back up to scratch. That's pretty much all we're going to do with Army Group West. We're going to keep um, the 1st Army under Mehmed Ali um, in the field. We will set to an offensive posture, but we're, gonna, we're not going to make any kind of moves. And we're going to keep the 5th Army, I think the same actually. What have we got? Just garrison forces. There are Austrian forces outside, I mean, in theatre, basically, in this tile in West Budapest. So we'll look to engage in those forces. It might be difficult doing that because of the weather, but in any case, we're going to hold, we're going to maintain the position um, in the west and begin piling the pressure on the east now and really looking to just kind of secure territory. Secure territory, hold it down, and take the fight to the Austrians. Um, but this is the moment that we don't really want to kind of take the, our boot off their throat sort of thing. I think that's pretty much it. Um, it is the beginning of a new decade, uh, so it's characterized by a number of things. One of those things is the opening up of a whole new host of kind of technologies uh, that we can at some point look to invest in. So things like military statistics, logistics, military intelligence, trench system, volley gun, military plans, and some really interesting uh, kind of technologies. Or at some point, I'll look into kind of a bit more detail what these will provide us. But for the time being. We are directly investing in a, in a whole range of technologies um, that actually began in 1860. So we are still very much behind. But investment still is still principally focused towards the Navy for the most part. With a couple of technologies, we've got one technology which is artillery forces, iron breech loading artillery, um, and also one economic technology which is hard rock mining, Yeah, which, is, which will be complete this year I think. That's it. Economic administration has been set. Imports and exports have been set. Um, the assets balance looks sound. No kind of real concerns there. Uh, so I'm going to put you on pause, pass turn, and we'll see you on the other side. Before I do that, I forgot to mention, there is a scripted event, uh, which has uh, popped up. Now, this is obviously just broken kind of code, but this is the Spanish Hohenzollern. So this 
is the catalyst for the Franco-Prussian War. I completely forgot to mention that, and as I was about to click past turn, I could kind of see the red, you know, the kind of red uh, warning. So, that could be interesting. There might be a war between Prussia and France. We'll see if that unfolds. One of the reasons I'm particularly interested in this is because if this war happens and it's scripted, and, you know, uh, if, if, if the end is scripted as well, then that might have ramifications for us. Because, in 77, there is a war between us and Russia, and the, the Ottomans lost that war in real life. Now, what I'm anxious about is that we lose that war, which results in... Well, in real life, in an independent Bulgaria forming, um, the Principality of Romania becoming a kingdom, and also we cede territory in the east, we cede cars to Russia. Now, if that happens, and we have no income of diplomats for 30 years, we have no means of reversing that decision. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, if that happens, I might look at a way of... Because... Yeah, I mean, like, that's that would be the really depressing and frustrating thing. If we're able to defend ourselves against Russia, I don't think it would be fair that we that we should have to kind of cede territory to them, you know. I mean, I kind of get that the, the peace conference in 77 was because the Europeans intervene and the British and the French arbitrate and they ultimately give a favourable deal to the Russians, but that's only because the Russians did so well. If the Russians were given an absolute hiding, there's no way that they would have sort of, you know, uh, they, they would have countenanced the Russians securing territory so i maybe might look at a way during that period where we can occasionally release a diplomat to the ottomans maybe once a, every five years or something like that so we're still basically isolated we're still you know uh you know it, it's 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 right and proper that we have a kind of um a government style you know i mean absolutely is monarchs uh, monarchs are highly personalized regimes so we should have a government style that reflect the characteristics of the monarch that we end up with but I don't like the idea of um, the game kind of railroading, which it does, unfortunately. Um, it may not, I may be wrong, but there's a really good chance that it will railroad our dissolution without us having the means to reverse that for 30 years. I don't really fancy that. So one of the reasons I'm interested in the uh, Franco-Prussian War is there's a pretty good chance that France might win that war in this game in a parallel universe. If it does... Do they still lose Alsace-Lorraine? We'll find out. I mean, we'll probably know within a year. So, anyway. Um, yeah, the Hohenzollern Spanish succession crisis has begun. That's the catalyst for the Franco-Prussian War, so we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'll put you on pause, and we'll see you in late Jan. Okay, welcome back. It is late January 1870, and a pretty lively round. Um, some, I mean, pretty, ast pretty astonishing actions, or at least in one case, anyway. Uh, it is mopping up, uh, still sizable engagements against the, you know, an Austrian force, which is, let's be sort of, you know, let's be frank, not sort of, uh, not fighting at its best. Um, first engagement then at um, uh, East Budapest. Um, I mean, it looks like that, that Austrian force is destroyed entirely. Um, for the, the loss of only 5,000 men, we take 22,000 uh, casualties, uh, sorry, uh, prisoners rather. Uh, yeah, I mean, just wholesale destruction of the Austrian force. So that's not the only occasion that that happens over the last sort of two weeks. Uh, so that's the first engagement. Second one is Bukovina. Um, Bezi Pasha is set to defense of posture because he's not activated. Nevertheless, there is an engagement. There is a larger Austrian force there than I had anticipated. Um, he does draw on support from adjacent forces. This is an Austrian commander, uh, Wilhelm uh, Ramming. Really good defensive commander by the looks of it. I think, unfortunately for the Austrians, they would really need, you know, uh, someone with just absolutely kind of astonishing skills at this point to kind of uh, turn any battles around. I mean, the morale of their forces is so very low, um, and their, their forces are just kind of melting away. We inflict 23,000 casualties, destroy a host of elements. That's nearly an army corps worth of forces. We take um, 11,000 uh, prisoners. We only suffer... You know, less than 2,000 casualties. Absolutely staggering stuff. Um, so the Austrian forces are just, yeah, they're crumbling. Um, and again, that's not the only battle. Um, Debrecen, uh, as I learned during the past turn, how this, this um, place is pronounced. Again, an Austrian force of 66,000 men. That force is entirely destroyed. I think probably, I mean, that's one of the most astonishing victories. It, it, not, not in terms of the overall number of casualties but that entire Austrian army is destroyed it's just uh, by the looks of it more than half of its surrender uh, we suffer you know less than 11,000 well, just over 11,000 casualties um, 
extraordinary victory. Um, and the last one, Klausberg. This is just really uh, Bezid Pasha mopping up and um, taking the town. This is just the sort of generic garrison that's uh, generated by the town. Uh, so a fortnight of overwhelming success in the winter snows um, and has resulted in us securing really Eastern Hungary. Um, we take uh, some prisoners, um, some officers prisoner. We can organize an Austrian reserve corps. We won't really do that. We'll send them to the kind of rear allow them to be constructed and then ultimately dissolve those forces and use the manpower to build regular forces, I think. Uh, we'll put them on rails. For the time being, we'll send them to Adrianople to the arsenal. Eight days, good stuff. And there was another Austrian force up here. I think we'll send them to Adrianople also. Adene. Okay. So that's the combat reports. I think, at the, yeah, again, at this stage, there's nothing really to be sort of uh, worried or concerned about them. There are still fairly, you know, fairly substantial Austrian forces. It just, I can't see them putting anything out of the bag at this stage. Um, we're going to hold position, I think, for the most part. Uh, we're going to keep uh, the Third Army in place. We're going to set to an offensive posture um, in Debrecen. Uh, we're going to do the same in East Budapest, for the time being, at least, anyway. Um... I think with the with the sixth army we're going to subtract um, Ahmed Esad Pasha, um, a core commander because he's activated. We're going to set him to a defensive posture, and we're going to move the remainder of the command north to Tarnopol. We're going to keep him here because there are Austrian forces uh, in the locale that we want to uh, mop up. So we're going to keep the Imperial Guard Corps back uh, from that command, and then we'll rejoin at a later date. Um, also, there's the concern that Austrian forces might try and move in behind. We are going to keep Bezid Pasha. Um, I mean, his force is in pretty good shape. It is rather tempting to actually do something with his force. As is the Third Army. I think, you know what, that's sort of to make hay while the sun is shining or while the snows are falling, as it were. Um... This appears to be just an Austrian commander, unless it's unless their force is concealed uh, in difficult weather. Um, we're going to move Abdelkarim Nadir north to Slovakia. I think this is Bratislava. Nine days. We'll set to assault. And we'll move there. Zid Pasha north. To Carpentan. We'll keep the pressure up in the east, I think, actually. There's no point in, in in standing still whilst our forces are in good shape. I mean, Army Group East, these two commands destroyed, you know, an Austrian force of over 100,000 men between them. And, you know, sort of, <laughs> their commands barely took a scratch. It's unbelievable. Um, so we'll keep the pressure up. Um, now that we have changed the settings, and it took a turn for those to come into effect... Well, the world has instantly become a diocese place, and it is going to be like that. I mean, uh, a lot more Cassas Valleys have opened up. There's now a much bigger chance, for example, of France intervening against us. I think France will get a claim on Tripoli, especially if Tunisia now becomes a French colony. So we now have to play a, a much more serious hardball game in Tunisia. Our aim is to tr try and keep Tunisia as a kind of terra incognita, not a terra incognita, a kind of um, a no man's land. And maybe even ourselves try and secure it as a colony. Because in the last analysis, if France ever does go to war with us and, you know, we're unable to defend ourselves and we're tied up elsewhere, um, Tunisia is a bit of kind of, you know, it's, it's a sort of, it's a pawn that we can trade. Um, it's not an incredibly wealthy area, um, but I think we've got pretty colonial penetration. You know, uh, we could be in a position, I don't think we are just yet. No, we're not in a position to push it for protectorate status. We could play this and try and force up a colonial penetration enough to get a leading position. I think at the moment, Piedmont Sardinia, it's, yeah, it's a Piedmont Sardinian, they have the dominant position. Uh, we kind of, we're third after, well, it's them, France, then us. But in other territories, we've got a pretty strong position. In Bizerte, we've got 35%. Uh, in Gabez, we're, what, 27? We're, when France has no colonial penetration to the south, so we need to just drive up our position. It would require us, I think, to actually move military forces, because the only cards that we can play now 
is going to be pacification to raise the colonial penetration in Tunis um, to the level that we need. What we can start doing, now we've played some cards uh, in the interior in Eritrea, what we can start doing, um, we're now in a position to push for protectorate status in both Somalia and Somaliland. We're going to begin with, I think, Somalia. Now will take a diplomat and a big chunk of uh, cash from the state coffers, and that's fine. That'll take a bit of time for that to come into effect. That will then result in um, Somalia transferring over to our military control and secure us as a halfway house. There is actually a chance, yeah. Piedmont suddenly might play a stake here. Um, I would suggest they're not in any kind of position to really back it up, but it could lead to a crisis, and that crisis could, you know, could result in them securing the region without a shot being fired, depending how it goes. But we'll sort of uh, we'll push for protectorate status anyway. And what I want to do really before we get to Abdul Hamid is to try and secure the colonies that we want in East Africa to try and secure them um, uh, proper uh, as as full colonies. Because if we don't have any income of diplomats, you know, Abdul Hamid is very isolationist, then we're not going to be in a position to sort of play any real colonial hands um, beyond really just defensive, you know, defensive colonial cards um, to try and kind of shore up our position in areas where we sort of merely have influence. It will mean that we won't really be able to participate in the kind of, you know, the real classical sort of traditional scramble for Africa, which is really in the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s. So we're trying to kind of get a little bit of a head start in the Horn of Africa and secure a position for ourselves. We've already got Zanzibar, which is good. Um, yeah, getting Somalia, Somaliland, Eritrea would be good. And then maybe, maybe it'll be touch and go because we've got, we'll have a closing window and maybe make a play for Abyssinia. But that is... It's a big territory and it's well defended. I mean, these. I mean, we thought we had a hard time in Aden. You know, Aden would be like a uh, Disney van compared to sort of um, to this crowd. I mean, the Abyssinians would be really hard work. Yeah, and some of Abyssinia is in a kind of terror incognita down here. So unless the means become available for us to explore this, we'd have to get a very high level of colonial penetration indeed for us to be able to even get protector status. And this is the only really African territory, I think, where the Abyssinians, they're fielding a force that's sort of European scale. It's like, you know, 100,000 men. I mean, it's not to the same standard, but the real problem is, is that it's much more difficult, even for us, for the European powers, to project that kind of force, to keep it supplied and this kind of thing, you know, it's, um, you need to project such a large force. And of course, most European powers, including us, we're tied up elsewhere in the Balkan Peninsula. So it's whether or not we really want to do that. I mean, that we would be embarking upon a large military campaign to pacify this region without any guarantees of success. You know, the Italians in real life tried and failed, so we'll see. If not, we could be looking at a real late game option. If no one colonizes the Abyssinians, it is something that we can do sort of, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, possibly. Uh, once Abdul Hamid's sort of days, is, days are over, I think that's what, 1907 or something like that. I mean, it's a long reign. It's a 30-year reign. So, we, you know, and it's going to be a period of isolationism. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We're going to keep up the pressure in the east. Um, in the west, we're going to keep um, keep a defensive posture, I think, for the most part. Keep the, the, the most important thing is we keep lines of communication open to Vienna. The supply situation now is resolved um, to that force in Vienna. And I'm... Um, reticent to kind of do anything dramatic the austrians aren't making i mean the austrians are all still at war with the british and the british have a force sitting at trieste now so the british are kind of covering the left flank um yeah so i'm reticent to do anything in the west i think we're just going to maintain our position as it is for the time being and keep the pressure up in the east now we've um we've made our kind of protector at play um, in Somalia, we've got a lot of private capital, a lot of manufactured goods. I think I've already set exports for the turn. Yeah, I have. I'm going to really quickly check assets balance. 1% inflation is fairly healthy. We've got very high levels of industrial growth at the moment. Um, and we do have a, quite a bit of private capital that we want to try and unload or convert into kind of um, plant. I think we're going to we'll continue focusing on developing the kind of Middle Eastern hinterland. Because these are areas that we know, historically, the Ottomans definitely keep. You know, the, the real anxiety that I have now is that I'm going to start building up some kind of industrial colossus in Sofia. The 77 war happens between, you know, with, between us and Russia. 
we lose no matter what happens, in the same way that we won the Crimean War no matter what happens, and then, yeah, Bulgaria is made independent, and we don't have any income of diplomats, so we can't reverse that, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I don't want to furnish a power that doesn't exist yet with the kind of huge amounts of industrial plant. It may happen, it may not. Uh, it may be that there's some sort of weird criteria that means that that doesn't fire. Maybe us controlling Bucharest or some weird thing like that means that um, that, that event won't fire. But I don't really know. You know, we'll, we'll find out in 1877 sort of thing. Salonica, I'm fairly confident. Remember, they, the Ottomans kept Salonica right up until the Balkan War, which was in like sort of 1912. Um, they still had Salonica because... Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, um, who, the famous general at Gallipoli and the founder of the Turkish Republic, he was born in Salonika, and one of the disputes that he had with the CUP, the Committee for Union and Progress, the government at the time, uh, which is really just a military junta, you know, um, is that they gave up Salonika um, as a part of the peace deal. Now, Salonika, even though in this game it's depicted as, you know, Turks are a minority, was ethnically a majority Turkish city, in point of fact. And... Um, yeah, I mean, and also by this time, the Ottoman Empire was beginning to develop. This obviously lays the foundations for the Turkish Republic. After this period, they, they was beginning to develop an ethnic characteristic. They were increasingly viewing themselves as only towards the end of the empire, the very end of it. They began viewing themselves as Turkish. They began viewing it as as an ethnically kind of, you know, uh, yeah, as an empire that's tied to Turkish identity and Islam. Um, well, I mean, to be fair, they probably, they, I think they always viewed it as being tied to Islam, but um, not to Turkish identity. Anyway, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk is from Salonika, and he was, um, he cracked a massive sad because Salonika was kind of uh, given over to the Greeks. He was from Salonika, and he was, a, you know, a Pashi. He was a sort of a, a powerful political figure, a general. So, we know that Salonika is basically safe until 1912. And in 1912, we no longer have Abdul Hamid on the throne, we have the CUP, and I, I would imagine we would have an income of diplomats during that period, because it's a period of, it, it, we're re-entering into a period of reform then, where the Ottomans are beginning to reach out, they're beginning to cut deals with the Germans and stuff like this, so we we'll are in a position to take it back, if, uh, if the game scripts us to lose it, sort of thing. That's it, that's the military operations. Now, uh, yeah, private capital, what am I going to build? Um, we're going to put a bit of a tangent there. Um, so we're going to focus on Damascus and Baghdad, maybe Mosul, Mosul's still very kind of modest, I don't think we're going to build anything in cars for, you know, the same sort of reason, Trabzond, we keep Trabzond, they keep right into the, they lose Trabzond temporarily during the First World War, but, um, Trabzond's a reasonable sized city as well, um, Zondalak, we have got this kind of interior really, sort of southern Anatolia, which is completely undeveloped, with reasonable sized settlements, um, and we've got railroads going into Konya, because uh, there's silk production there. We could build a factory in Konya, couldn't we? One thing we are going to do is we prospected some coffee. So first things first, we've got a bit of coffee plantation. That's good. Let's quickly check opium. Yeah, this, we can't develop any more opium plantations. And we've already got a coffee plantation in Eritrea, good stuff. Cotton. Opium. Okay, that, that cost us nothing, so we, were, we are going to build a factory. I think we're going to go for maybe Damascus, um, for the time being. We could also look at Beirut, you know, Damascus, Beirut, Jerusalem. Um, so we've got a steel plant going in. What is that iron production like? Let's check really quickly. And we've got a huge stockpile of it, which suggests that, yeah, um, we're probably not going to build an iron mine, but... 
Yeah, and a pretty big income of iron. I mean, the iron mines that we have, we've upgraded quite heavily, so um, building more iron mines is going to be fairly pointless. And this stockpile is large enough now that it's going to basically start zeroing out. Round figures, there we go. So, iron is good, coal is good. I'm considering another shipbuilding plant. Um, because it generates prestige, supply, and manufactured goods. And prestige is something that we're playing almost constantly catch up. We've got a shipbuilding plant in Smyrna, I believe, and in Constantinople. We don't have one in Smyrna, that's a lie. Why don't I think we had a, um, an additional shipbuilding plant? Let's check, uh, maybe it's Synop. No, we don't. Hmm. Yeah, we do have one. We have one. Uh, we have one being built now. Oh, I'm going mad. <laughs> yeah, it's being constructed there already. Okay. Um, so I think uh, yeah, we don't need a, a, another one then. Um, Can's good. Can goods is surplus the requirements. I think steel. We've got a lot of steel plants going in. Fourteen hundred. That leaves us. Yeah, we'll stick another uh, manufactured goods shop then in Damascus. And that was an especially expensive one. That leaves us with 81 steel, 190 manufactured goods, 100 for export, leaves us with 90 if they all exported, which they almost certainly won't. Yeah, according to here, we have 121. According to here, 81. I can't remember how it made sense, but it. Assets balance is good anyway. We're meeting domestic demand for everything, so I'm happy with that. Get these boys back to Benghazi. I'm going to try and look to try and build up uh, Libya a little bit, um, mostly in terms of sort of supply, its defense infrastructure, ports, our ability to bring supplies into Libya, because it is going to become more of a target. I'm thinking of the French and the Italians. I mean, obviously, Italy's not done terribly well in its war with Austria, but that war will end eventually, and I suspect Italy will reacquire the Italian peninsula. And um, yeah, I mean, at some point it is going to establish itself as a fairly powerful kingdom, possibly in the next decade, and we don't want to be playing catch-up in Libya, really. Um, it is a sparsely populated and underdeveloped area for the most part. Um, and I want us to have the means to defend it, really. Um, Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder why it won't allow us to build a road in Misrata. Our military control is 100%. We've got good loyalty for the most part. Um, hmm.
What's the requirements for road building? Yeah, Conley um, or higher status between 25 and 100 colonial penetration. It's not clear why, um, but it's a track, which means we won't be able to build railroads on it. Uh, we have to build a road network, I, I suppose, in order to move the heavy goods into the area necessary to then lay railroads, the uh, sort of the timber and the steel and stuff and iron and this kind of thing. It's frustrating. I wonder why that is. Is all roads, major road in Tunis itself. Mm, we'll fall off that sort of bridge later, I think. Um, we have some construction happening in, in uh, Tripoli anyway. We're upgrading a naval base uh, there just now, and we're upgrading the anchorage of Benghazi. That's okay, I think. We might upgrade the, the, um, the depot. Okay, that's it. I'm going to really quickly check through the other reports, just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Osman Nuri is promotable. We won't do it just yet, but it's good to know that he is promotable because, I mean, <coughs> excuse me. You know, a lot of these old generals, I mean, 1850 was 20 years ago. So if these guys are in their 50s then, you know, they're in their 70s now sort of thing. I mean, some of the generals were quite young. Uh, you know, they're in their 40s, but even if they're 40s, they're in their 60s now. So that you're going to going to be start looking at a, a lot of, you know, faces that have been with us since the beginning of the campaign. They're going to start retiring. We're going to be seeing a new generation come through. Getting Osman, um, Osman Nuri in a position for promotion is good. He's got good stats. Um, you know, for the most part, a defensive commander, but he's got a high strategic value. Um, and even though these are his abilities, you know, he's a little bit kind of railroaded in terms of his characteristics. Um, these things will trump though these things ultimately. If we can, if he becomes experienced enough, despite the fact that he's typically quite cautious, you know, there's some examples of, of generals that are historically kind of very cautious, but they become quite good generals based on well arguably based on experience and the right kind of conditions and thinking of people like i suppose montgomery i mean it's debatable whether he was a very good general really but i mean um he was quite a cautious general and yet is nevertheless a revered and, and renowned sort of general you know um so someone like um someone like uh osman uh, nuri could easily become something like that that's that's fine um Yeah, good round economically. Well, we are selling some iron. Cereals. Luxury goods. Mm -mm. We're selling coal as well. Yeah, so coffee. We prospected tropical fruits. This is not an area that we actually control. Or rather, we do militarily control it. But we don't have legal political control over this region. So we can't exploit, for example, dyes and tropical fruits. In fact, these are all things that we want to exploit. This is t technically a part of Oman. So I think it will naturally return to their control. We periodically gain control over it because insurgents come from kind of the, uh, you know, the Central Arabian Peninsula. They conduct raids. We re reacquire military control over the region. Um, but we don't legally control this region. We would have to... We could... We could Theoretically, declare war on Oman now. Now that the sort of um, we have expanded spheres of influence and claims, we could we could declare war on Iran and secure bordering regions, uh, which is an option. You know, it's something that we could consider doing. But this is unclaimed territory. <clears throat> yeah, so this is a part of Oman. Colonial capital Muscata, yeah. So, because it's a kind of national territory, uh, we can't colonize it. It's sort of, it's like Egypt. It's just politically, it's, it's politically too 
sort of you know too centralized to to sort of efficiently run it's not like a decentralized tribal area where we can we can play our little bag of tricks and get colonial penetration uh, that won't that won't cut any you know that won't cut sort of uh that <laughs> won't cut very much in the you know man um they have a kind of centralized political authority that just means that we can't do that so we would we would have to militarily muscle into the region really um it's a minor power so declaring war it wouldn't have any significant consequences, but anyway. Yeah, nothing alarming in the reports, other than the fact that there's now many more Casus Bellies. Russia has a Casus Belli against its Ennea because of Batumi. Be interesting to know whether this change of options, what impact it has. I mean, one of the things that's benefited us really is the kind of stultifying effect of the scandinavian war in terms of um russian foreign policy it means they've, been, they've become bogged down and distracted in a way that they weren't historically you know in this strangest sort of way us changing this you know us uh, us changing claims and this kind of thing it probably won't affect russia very much because russia anyway has a claim over most of its bordering regions with prussia and austria and sweden so it, maybe it won't too much but um Maybe it will, I don't know. Time will tell, but they've been at war for sort of 10, 15 years in Scandinavia, bogged down, and we've been a real beneficiary of that, of course. Okay, that looks good. Hard Rock Mining's on 96. It's late Jan. Going to put you in pause. We're going to pass turn. All the moves have been made. The economy's set. Um, we've got less private capital now, which is healthy. Uh, we'll see you on the other side in early Feb. Okay, welcome back. We are in early February. Uh, no significant engagements over the last fortnight. Um, our continued offensive sort of into the Carpathians and securing really the eastern part of the Austrian Empire continues uh, the engagements are just very small they're really just securing towns um and the only resistance are, are from sort of generic garrisons uh that are formed uh the austrians have not conducted any kind of offensive they're not tried to make any kind of moves of their own and uh, by the looks of it their forces are just sort of um, atrophying and yeah it's just a case now of i think probably by may we should have this in the bag um, i'm not sure if the austrians have offered us anything this turn let's have a look no, in terms of pieces that we can offer them, we're not quite there yet. I mean, it depends what we want to push for, but I'm thinking claimed regions, Valachia, which is Bucharest, and say Illyrian, um, which I think is um, Katero, and we don't quite enough have enough points for that yet. I mean, if we wanted to go for like Spalata, which is Dalmatia, we could leave Katero as like a kind of like an exclave, almost like a kind of Venetian style port and take something a little bit bigger and juicier we're quite far short that said once we secure a couple more cities in prague this sort of thing uh, i think there'll be no real issue and at some point it's likely the austrians are going to offer us two territories i think if they offer us two territories as long as one of those territories is bucharest because we are still technically at war with uh, romania and we it's going to be a much a bit of a longer wait really for romania for us to get the points necessary to secure drabeta and we do want Drabeta because Drabeta, along with Bucharest, secures the north bank of the Danube and, crucially, gives us good access to coal. Um, I mean, between the... Yeah, we're looking at sort of five... Yeah, I mean, five kind of coal installations. One of, one of them has already been built, actually, um, in Bucharest. And that might be kind of... Might be kind of zero sum um, in the coming period. One of the reasons for that is we've just secured a technology, which is an 1870 technology, which we get straight away. So it's kind of osmosis style. Uh, we have access to it. Presumably, um, neighboring powers already have this. It's maybe more common in northern and western Europe, but that is steam tractors. This is then the beginning of the mechanization of agriculture. Now, this is where the, the economy becomes increasingly a sort of interlaced. Um, 
I'm assuming, I don't know yet, but say for example we upgrade a tobacco plantation or a cereal, uh, cereal field, that will then create a demand for mechanical parts. Every fortnight, um, our cereal farms or coffee plantations or opium plantations, um, you know, vineyards or fruit plantations, they will all begin to consume mechanical parts which we manufacture, unless we want to import them, we can, but that makes everything less efficient because obviously that eats into our private capital. So to have good domestic access to mechanical parts would be positive for our economy, would allow for much greater kind of liquidity in the economy. Uh, so that in turn requires us to produce mechanical parts, which requires us to produce steel if we're going to do it in a cost-effective way, which requires us to have you know even more access to coal. So the economy is becoming sort of very interdependent. We've seen this a little bit already with mechanical parts, requiring steel and by virtue of that coal uh, and now it's tying you know significantly increased kind of um, agricultural yield to having an, an industrial base um i think what we're going to do we've got a bit of capital we've got some steel we've got some manufactured goods to begin with we're just going to upgrade the rgos um around constantinia so we've got, we've got a tobacco plantation and we've got a cereal farm we're going to upgrade those we'll have a look next turn to see how it because it doesn't really give us any kind of clue i kind of um managed to zero in on steam tractors uh where is it i had zeroed in on steam tractors it's instantly gone what, what have i done um steel rails hang on do i need to sort of uh yeah so industrial Yeah, steam tractors. So it adds 11 new structures to the force pool, which is in effect just upgraded structures. So if we now build a cereals farm, I think that cereals farm would be an upgraded variety um, as new. I may be wrong there, but in any case, the 11 new structures are upgraded varieties of those things we already have. Um, these modifiers will be applied to your faction, 100% modifier to the AI stockpile, 500% modifier to the base intrinsic production to the following merchandises. 500% modifier to the base intrinsic production. Cereals, um, rice, fruits, wines, tobacco, coffee, tropical fruits, tea. Also, opium, uh, which it doesn't say. Uh, well, at the very least, you can upgrade opium. Um, so we might do that as well. Uh, well. No, no, we'll leave that because that leaves us with relatively little private capital. Uh, let's see how much we need for our operational costs. It's sitting, yeah, we actually can't even upgrade all of those things. Okay, let's... Um, Go back then, and uh, what will we upgrade? So, cereal farms. Okay, we're just going to begin by upgrading the tobacco plantation. We've got a fairly large agricultural base, of course. We were fairly careful early on in the game, at the beginning of the campaign, to kind of broaden our agricultural base, to exploit all of the agricultural regions that we can, to ensure that we kind of root our economy in a kind of in the logic of capitalist production, of having a large kind of. Um, I got economy to scale, having a large kind of enterprises that are producing large amounts of goods that generates more private capital, that generates more uh, tax revenue. Uh, so we have a lot that we can upgrade, and that's going to be a focus, I think, probably for the next few years for our private capital manufactured goods, is to reinvest that into agriculture. Um, that might end up being a bit of a game changer in terms of where we are. There's a good chance the Americans, for example, have had access to this technology for some time, probably before time. Uh, which is one of the reasons why they enjoy such a lead with regard to tobacco production. Where is tobacco? Um, uh, this, this is probably maddening to watch if you're watching and you can see. There we go. So we're sort of... Um, Chesapeake is churning out 116. Oh no, 80, I beg your pardon. Sorry, demand is 116. South Brazil, 40. West Ultimate, 18. So we are lagging behind. Uh, we're still third. We're still the third biggest you know, tobacco producer in the world, and, and the United States is is already by now really becoming a large transcontinental nation um, with a big tobacco culture, and we're pretty much new to the game. In 1850, we had no tobacco culture at all. Um, it was it's a new, you know, it's only 20 years old as a part of our economy, so it's not so bad. And Mexico, Mexico's fast catching up. Mexico wasn't really a, much of a sort of a player 10, 15 years ago. We'll keep an eye on that. So first investment then is to upgrade the tobacco plantation in um, in Constantinople. And what was it? You output is five. Operational cost is seven. Seven capital. So it's very easy to be able to see what changes 
uh, come from that. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it, I think. I'll probably leave um, this video here. It has been, I think, another five or six days. Uh, so uh, the, the next few updates I'll try and make a bit more regularly. It's a uh, life, sort of real life's been a little bit busy the last kind of month or so in a relative sort of a way. So I've had a little bit less time to sit down and kind of play the game. Uh, but in the next sort of week or two, I should have more free time. So I'll try and get a few updates in the next week, two or three updates maybe in the next five or six days. And um, I think we'll pick up. Um, there's no real moves. In fact, the only military moves I'm going to make is to really continue the pressure in the east. So we'll get sort of the 6th Army, for example, moving up to Lemberg. Uh, we'll get, um, in fact, the detached army corps. We've got 100% military control. We'll bring um, up at Esat Pasha up to Lemberg also. That's a 12-day march. And we'll bring the 4th Army out of Bayezid to assault... Um, Uh, Carpenton Voland, Carpenton Voland, um, which I'm, I'm quite sure I'm mispronouncing, but um, we'll conduct an assault on Carpenton Voland, and then we'll also conduct an assault on Trapal, I think, or not. The other option might be to move no. Mm. Actually, we'll get um, Abdi Pasha up to Presburg. Six days. And we'll actually get the third army to Krakow, I think. So terrain and difficult weather is making this, uh, is rooting this in an interesting way. I mean, there's blizzards in the Alps, probably completely, in, well, I'd imagine either impassable or just extremely high levels of attrition, but it is a, it's a cold winter. Snowfall all over the Balkans. I think we might keep the Third Army in place for the time being as a kind of hinging force uh, because he can support um, both calm pit. Carpet vol Carpetenvoland. Carpetenvoland. He can support um, Bezid to the north and Abbey to the south. And it makes sense to push um, the 4th Army on to Krakow before we then move the 3rd Army. So I think we'll keep him as a kind of hinge force in place at uh, Kremnitz for the time being. Um... I think we're in a position now we don't need to worry too much about Austrian forces in Hungary, but there are no more Austrian forces in Hungary. So I think we're going to now relocate this. Uh, in fact, there's an army corps, uh, which we shouldn't forget about. Still missing an element. I think that army corps needs to be in a depot, that's why. It needs to be in a depot town. I've got kind of attrition set to historical. It's not sufficient that, that he's just in a town, he needs to sit in a depot. That's okay, I mean, he's short one regiment that'll be reconstructed after the war. Um... It's kind of small potatoes. Uh, let's get um, Hussein Avenue round to Trieste. That's an 11 day march, which is pretty good going actually, especially given the weather. Although the weather's better on the coast. Um, and that's a good staging area then for, for him to begin, begin to conduct a campaign. I guess in the kind of Austrian interior, maybe northern Italy, we can maybe look at securing Verona. Uh, maybe help, help the Italians out a little bit. Resecure sort of uh, some of the northern Italy. I mean, once we liberate these regions, they will go over to Italian control. Um, With Austrian national morale as low as it is, a lot of these regions will probably start flipping fairly soon anyway. Um, yeah, Trieste is good. We're keeping, a, we're keeping, uh, we're keeping on, on an offensive posture in case any Austrian forces kind of... Um, any Austrian forces trying to move from sort of Udin uh, into Trieste. Yeah, so that's it. That's going to be the military moves that we make. Uh, I'm going to check on the fleet really quickly. Um, it is in Constantinople. Um, yeah, that's a good shape. Uh, 
Let's see if the Austrians have any traders. No traders. Keep the fleet there for the time being. They're still taking on food and water. Uh, so, yeah. So, I have to say economic admin. Okay, that's good. Assets balance is good. Yeah, so I'll leave this video here in early February then. Um, kicks off a new decade. And, um, yeah, we'll begin then in late February. Uh, maybe I'll do a bit of a bumper episode next time. Because uh, it's, it's only six weeks, really. We're covering six weeks of the campaign. Relatively short video. I think I usually do two months. Maybe I, I, don't know, maybe I usually do six weeks. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, we'll pick up. I'll pass the term. We'll pick up next video in uh, late February. So thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.